All right, let's talk about flowering bulb crops. Uh, we've kind of talked about flowering bulbs a couple times with the Easter lilies and some other crops, but flowering bulbs are, uh, you'll see them listed um, as geophytes primarily, because geophyte means the, the, the uh, growing in the ground. It could be anything, um, we talk about flowering bulbs and floriculture, it could be anything from a bulb or corm, tuber, tuberous roots, that includes everything from dahlias to tulips, so uh, to lilies. And most of these have a life cycle that pretty much limit them to spring crops. And uh, if you're a, if a flowering bulb forcer, uh, most of them are looking at Valentine's Day, Easter, Mother's Day, some crop like that. And some of these flowering bulbs is, is pretty, pretty uh, popular, especially when it's cold and nasty and it's, the weather's bad, you're depressed, and you bring in that, that sweet uh, flowering bulb that, the, the, with a rich aroma. Now, the, the geophytic storage organ is um, this, it's, is the survival, the evolutionary survival um, mechanism this plant has, has uh, developed over, over its uh, evolution. And when you're thinking about growing a flowering bulb, uh, what you need to do is look and think about where that, that geophytic organism was from, uh, where it's indigenous. Um, and the most important thing with most of these is uh, temperature. Some of them are different. Amaryllis, for instance, is water, um, but it's because it's a tropical flowering bulb. Most of them, uh, the spring flowering bulbs, actually develop their flower primordia during the late summer, okay? Before they go through. Tulips, for instance, um, develop their, their flower primordia during the late summer, whereas lilies develop their flower primordia after vernalization period. So if you're doing your landscape planting, you're gonna plant your spring flowering bulbs outside in the fall, um, or you may take your uh, bulbs, pot them up, and plant those outside or put the, the containers outside in a ground bed over the, in the fall and let them overwinter, or bring them in a refrigerator. So they typically overwinter under the low temperatures, and then with the warmth of the, when the ground starts to warm up is when they naturally bloom. So there's five stages of uh, geophyte production. And the first stage is the development of the storage organ or the bulb. And that could be done by a farm, done um, uh, by another grower. Um, and they typically ship the, the flowering bulbs to you. Um, the next stage is programming, putting together the, the how you're going to put, what, what your season, what your production time is, what your practices are going to be, uh, putting together the program, pl potting the bulb, getting it scheduled, getting it rooted in the container. And the third stage, uh, stage two can also include the chilling uh, period. Stage three is the flower forcing. We've the, that's when you bring it into the greenhouse and you're pushing out the bulb. Stage four and five is marketing, delivering it to the retail consumer. And the fifth stage, of course, is the consumer. Um, we've all seen, um, retail displays of flower bulbs, um, but being in the greenhouse is not quite so common. Now, typically, um, there's a couple of different ways to do greenhouse forcing. Forcing begins when we take and we put the, put the bulb into a rooting room, and that's where we get the roots growing of the bulb, get the bulb established in the container, and uh, then at some point during the rooting room, we're gonna move it into a, a cooler. This is a uh, a rooting room, uh, which is actually, it's a walk-in cooler, multi, very tall walk-in cooler where the tulips are stacked on these racks and um, to get, to, to do the vernal, the, not the vernalization, to break the, f the flower bud dormancy. If it was a lily, we'd be doing the vernalization, but here we're breaking the dormancy of tulips. And um, if the bulbs are already pre-chilled, you may uh, force them in the greenhouse directly from the bulbs. Just depends on how you're, you're bringing in your bulbs, if they're pre-treated, pre-chilled, or if you need to put them in here. Um, forcing ends when, you, when you're uh, pushing the bloom. 
Uh, some people are doing this as cut flowers. Most people are doing this flowering pot plants and when they're sent to the market. So there's a couple of different types of scenarios we can use for most of our uh, spring blooming plants that require a, a cooling period. Uh, sequence A, uh, you'll bring in your, your containers and you'll store them in the rooting room after they're potted. And we're going to leave them at 48 degrees Fahrenheit, which is fairly warm. Um, and we're going to let them grow until we start to see roots growing out the bottom of the pot. At that point, uh, we're going to drop the temperature and um, a little cooler to 41, usually between 38 and 41, but 41 is the magic number. Um, I call that beer temperature. Um, and the, uh, the stem, the green flowering stem, is actually going to be about, not the flowering stem, green leaves, is going to be about an inch or two inch ex out the top. And then we're going to drop it to, to even colder. And at that point, then we'll bring it out. Now, this is the timing of the rooting room. Another alternative is 48, 41. And this is just uh, a little later sequence. And um, the sequence A, sequence B uh, just depends on what your, uh, what your crop scheduling is. And uh, whether you, most of the people that are choosing something like sequence B um, are typically uh, poinsettia growers and they're not able to deal with their lilies until after the poinsettias are done or they may be mixing their crop with Easter lilies in the cooler as well. Now, one of the things that's important to remember is when we're dealing with bulbs, bulb crops is the energy of the flower is already there in the bulb. And the, the major challenge we have is anchoring that bulb in a container without drowning it. So we want to anchor that bulb. We're going to give it enough moisture. And the tulips are planted fairly high, but you can see a pretty heavy mass of roots. So we want to make sure we anchor the bulb well. And that we're giving it good stability, so it's, it's not going to be, we need to have good ballast. So a lot of people are using fair, fairly heavy mixes to give it good anchorage, but yet it's got to have sufficient uh, moisture holding capacity and sufficient aeration. Bulbs are actually pretty easy to grow, and I'm going to talk about a few uh, specific ones um, that are probably not that common to some people. But one of my favorite ones is the calla lily, or zetascantia. Uh, the common um, calla lilies that we'll see in production are the white ones and everybody thinks that this is a funeral flower um, but there's a lots of new miniature zetascantias coming out in the market lots of purples and lavenders um, these are typically um, native to central Africa uh, also in uh, lowland regions of New Zealand now these are fairly wet and they go through wet dry cycles and they're, they're, they're dormant when it's dry so they're fairly wet. They leave lots and lots of water. And here's some uh, cut flower beds of some of the purple, purple ones. And um, since this is uh, native to swampy, wet ground, if you were to let Zadiscantia go dry, it will go dormant immediately. So we need to make sure we maintain it fairly wet. And if the cut flower growers actually will stop watering just to force it into dormancy, and um, uh, this way, if you, those, the growers that I've seen growing uh, Zetascantia here in Colorado, they just keep them constantly wet so they're constantly blooming. Freesia, F-R-E-E-S-I-A, not O-A. Freesia is, is an iris. It's native to South Africa. It's a corm. Um, and we'll do, uh, the people that are growing freesia as cut flowers, they'll plant them directly in the benches or flats or their bulb pans in the uh, early fall. And they'll plant, you plant them densely so the actually corms are actually touching each other, especially for containers. And for instance, th they're little bitty guys, so 10 to 12 corms in a five inch pot. And um, this is a, a, f a bed of uh, freesia, it looks kind of ratty. But 
uh, for cut flower freesia production, that's just the way it looks. You know, we're not selling a pretty looking flower bed, but this actually this bed was is in the process of being final harvest. But it's um, pretty common. Um, freesia is a cold temperature crop. Another one out there that's fairly common is the hyacinth. Um, Christmas, uh, they're sold Christmas through uh, late April. It's an easy bulb to force. It's actually an easy bulb to force at home, and you can see these are actually in forcing, forcing uh, globes. Easter is the main season. Um, there are, um, you can get them prepared where they're already um, uh, grown uh, with temperature and for early forcing and um, so forth. High sense, uh, 10 weeks of cold treatment. Uh, they're a little bit complicated in that uh, we uh, have a chilling period like we saw earlier. Um, we'll hold them. One of the good things about a lot of our bulb crops is we can go ahead and put them in the cooler with our chilling temperature and we can bring them out and force them on a schedule based upon when we're going to market that crop. And um, so we'll put them in the, in the rooting room, hold them at uh, 41 after we've gone through the first stage of uh, 48. This is the, the first part, the 48 degrees is the rooting temperature. Then we're going to hold them uh, where they're going to grow. And once that, that stem, the green stem, the green leaves hit an inch and a half, we'll drop the temperature and block it. And as soon as we take them out of storage, we can um, push them at 73 um, greenhouse temperatures to for forcing. If you push them too hard, you won't get good flower uh, flowering. But we're looking at anywhere the season, mid-January or late February. And this is a good impulse crop because um, Highest scents have a very strong aroma, and uh, when you put them out uh, for sale, people just about can't resist them. Tulips. Um, they say that there are more tulips grown per square mile in the Netherlands than anywhere else. Everybody thinks of tulips, they think of Holland. Are tulips from Holland? Where are tulips native? Turkey. Turkey. They're native to Turkey. Sent there, um, but um, most tulips that are grown in the United States actually come from Michigan, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, tulips can be grown either as a cut flower crop or a potted crop. The tulips that are grown for cut flowers are bred for longer stems. The tulips that are bred for pot crops have shorter stems. Um, here's a, a farm where they're actually going through and, and cutting the flower uh, buds off. This is a, a farm where they're growing uh, the bulbs for sale. And um, the flower um, parts are present, but not fully formed when they dig them, because they, they, they're going to be dormant. Um, and they'll go through several stages of growth. Now, once they're dug, they're stored at a fairly warm temperature to, to to stimulate the final development of the floral parts inside the bulb. At, however, they want to make sure that they're not overheated. Uh, and one of the problems I see with bulbs that are shipped is they're shipped in, typically shipped in sea packs, you know, these large um, on, on uh, crates uh, that come on ocean liners from Holland uh, on uh, shipping. And one of the things that we watch for is um, make sure that they've been overheated in that shipping stage. Uh, what most, most flower shippers do or bulb shippers do is they, they'll pack in um, little, uh, they're called hobo temperature re uh, recorders and they're just about the size of a quarter and they'll throw them in the ca a couple of cases and um, to track the temperature to make sure they haven't gotten excessively warm. Another thing that can happen in, in shipping cases if it gets excessively warm is they'll, if they're exposed to ethylene gas during that shipping, and which will cause the flowers to blast and you'll have erratic bloom. I've seen that pretty regular too. Um, so when your shipments come in, if the center of the bulb is brown, 
You know, you need to look at the bulb. If you look at the top of the bulb, look at it down, and it's not firm. If it's brown and soft, it's been exposed to high temperature. Uh, and at that point, um, don't try to force it. Call the carrier, take pictures, and send it to the, uh, you know, to your whoever your supplier is because they've, the carrier is screwed up. Um, we call it stage G, and um, what we do is uh, cut the bulbs up to see where our flower development is. Um, and if they've hit uh, the stage G, which means all the flowering parts are present, then it's ready to go through that chilling period for the dormancy. And to look at that, to determine the stage G, and I don't remember if I got a picture of that or not, um, you, s you have to dig the bulb, you have to cut the bulb open, and, and you put a little bit of um, ink. It's kind of like a, um, and what the liquid ink does is it, it will give you the outline of the flowering parts. And we're hoping that when you're getting your bulbs in late September, October, that they're already at stage G, and you can go ahead and can do this. Um, When we put them into the greenhouse, we want to make sure that um, what they'll do initially when, they, when you store them is you put them under the bench to get things up and growing and get them warmed up, and, um, or else cover them up with light, uh, a light shade cloth or some reme fabric or something like that. Uh, we need a night temperature of 63 and a day temperature of 68. If we get the temperature too high, the the stems will get elongate and be weak, and the plant will be floppy. Uh, 